Hello, ladies and gentlemen. It has been a while, but I'm trying to get back to this now. And today we're going to do a bit different. We're not focusing on one person, but one person's idea and expanding upon it. We're going to talk about Alexandra Kolontai. Born March 19th, 1872, died March 9th, 1952. Alexandra is the first female Bolshevik to be part of the Bolshevik party in the higher echelon of it and being very influential with her ideas and mostly the ideas of Marxist feminism. And that's what we're going to talk about today. She has presented a few ideas which I find quite interesting to talk about. And I want to talk about these ideas with you present a few different scenarios and sort of see what we can get with it, yes? So I want you to listen to something Alexandra wrote. Imagine a society, a people, a community, where there are no longer Meshenka ladies and Meshenka laundresses, where there are no parasite and no hired workers, where all people do the same amount of work and society in return look after them and helps them in life. Just as now the Mashenka ladies are taken care of by their relatives, those who need more attention, the women and children, will be taken care of by society, which is like one large, friendly family. When Mashenka, who is now neither a lady nor servant, but simply a citizen, becomes pregnant, she does not have to worry about what will happen to her and her child. Society, that big happy family, will look after everything. A special home with a garden and flowers will be ready to welcome her. It will be so designed that every pregnant woman and every woman who has just given birth can live there joyfully in health and comfort. The doctors in the society, family, are concerned not just about preserving the health of the mother and child, but about relieving the woman of the pain of childbirth Science is making progress in this field and can help the doctors here. When the child is strong enough, the mother returns to her normal life and takes up again the work that she does for the benefit of the larger family society. She does not have to worry about her child. Society is there to help her. Children will grow up in kindergarten, the children's colony, the creche, and the school under the care of experienced nurses. When the mother wants to be with her child, she only has to say the word. And when she has no time, she knows they're in good hands. Maternity is no longer a cross. Only its joyful aspects remain. Only the great happiness of being a mother, which at the moment only the Mashenka ladies enjoy. But such a society, surely, is only to be found in fairy tales. Could such societies even exist? The science of economics and the history of society and the state shows that such a society must and will come into being. However hard the rich capitalists, factory owners, landowners and men of property fight, the fairy tale will come true. The working class all over the world is fighting to make this dream come true. And although society is as yet far from being one happy family, although there's many struggles and sacrifices ahead, it is at the same time true that the working class in other countries has made great gains. Working men and women are trying to lighten the cross of motherhood by getting laws passed and by taking other measures. This text gives a bit of an oversight of what she wants to accomplish. There's a lot more. For example, individual love between people isn't a thing. It should be a thing of love to the collective. And what I find interesting about this text is where does responsibility of a child go? And shouldn't the caretaking be done by the parents? Now, the interesting thing here that you mentioned is when it comes to rich folk, Many times they don't actually take care of the children. They send them to boarding school, they have nannies and all that type of deal. So in a sense, they use a collective in which they exploit to raise their children. But that's not the norm. 
The norm is that the mother and the father will take care and put on the values that they have onto their child and then hoping that when they become an adult, they have good values ingrained in them. So I want to talk about three different scenarios here. One is what she presented here, that your child is taken care of by the collective. And the second one is the completely opposite, one of Anne Rand. So there's actually one book I like from Rand, and it is Anthem. It talks about more or less this, a society of what Alexandra wants. There is no individual, it's all collective, and it's all done for the collective good. You're born in society, you learn the trades to help the collective, your love is for the collective, all is for the collective. But Rand view this as a negative thing. And in the story, the person who was raised in this collective rebels from it and goes into the wilderness to be an individual together with his wife. Now, here, he even states that it is not perfect, it is flawed, it's not as easy as it is in the collective, but it's freedom to choose your own path. It's freedom to do mistakes. And we take this into child rearing, and that the child is the responsibility of the parents. It's an individual, it can be raised with any values it wants, that doesn't have to be for the collective good. The third option can be described as the child being grown up by the tribe. So not the collective, but a sort of close kin of the child. It could be family or close, someone close tied to the family. And here uh, I have some experience, sadly. When I was uh, born, my grandfather and grandmother on my father's side gave my parents an option, sort of an ultimatum, let's be honest here. They said, for three years, we can take care of your child, Monday to Friday, so you can work. And on Saturday and Sunday, you can come and pick up the child. So in a sense, to not hinder labor, and this is what uh, Alexander also wanted in a way, not to hinder labor, someone else would take care of the child, in my case, would have been my grandparents. But I should note that my parents said no to this. They wanted to raise me as their own. Because it's, it's insane to uh, remove the child from the mother's hand, to let someone else raise it who has no emotional connection to it, the same way as a mother does. It's still about that the kin grows the child up. So we have three options here. The collective, the tribe, and just individual, which I define as parents, will grow the child up. Now what is the best? Now I don't know the answer to that question. I just know that I'm getting sicker and I want to record, kind of because I do enjoy to record when I'm kind of sick. It makes me sound better. So uh, I should also point out another thing. It's uh, the John Rawls argumentation of childs. So, John Rawls stated that all children is born with a blank slate, and this is sort of one what can understand in Alexandra as well, like, you know, that you aren't anyone's child, you are the collector's child. But in the actuality, you have, regardless of, you know, regardless of uh, societal things, there are certain things that is put upon you regardless. Now John Bolton said, no, every child is a blank slate. Every child can be formed and molded in a way of their experience as being a child. And the society and the people and the other around them. But no, you have certain traits that is inherent to you due to biology. And people will get angry about this, but I will say this. Why does a crocodile know how to be a crocodile, even though it's never been around the crocodiles? It's because it's ingrained in them to be crocodiles. And there's certain ingrained abilities in humans, too, that can't be blank slated away. So biology matters in this aspect. So there's certain blank slots that would not be there. Okay. And usually this is, uh, you can see part of it by how the parents are, and it will affect the child. So parents have certain traits that will affect the child in certain ways. Not a big deal. Just wanted to point that one out. To criticize Alexandra, it's by the blank slate one. We'll think the way that she does through love of the collective. 
but uh, and that by raising the child correctly, everybody can have these ideas ingrained in them. But in actuality, that's not how anything works. And humans in particular, they like to be contradictory. They like to rebel. It's part of their nature to rebel. So even if you have a very good utopic society of this community, people will rebel. And why? Well, psh, who knows? But I don't believe in the pure individualistic one either, because one should still care for the commons around them, the people around them. One should be ingrained in a way that doesn't damage the people around you. And when it can one, it's a bit harder. It can leave pain and can leave suffering. I do believe, in some sense, the society can help your child grow up if necessary, with schooling and other things, kindergarten. But that the parents have a responsibility firsthand, and if the parents fail, then it's the close kin, and if the close kin fails, in society. So in a way, all of them are correct, it's just depending on how far the kid has gone. The society shouldn't have to intervene if the parents are in good health, and good care, and good mind, and sound mind, and rational mind. But sometimes they're not. And therefore you look at what kin could take care of. If the kins are not in sound mind, rational mind, logical mind, then society. And society is flawed, will always be. So they should not be the sole caretaker. But if no other option is available, it should always be an option that is there. But it shouldn't be forced upon anybody to give away your child. Especially not for the aspect of labor. Because why labor if labor is unnecessary? Labor for the collective just for the sake of labor does not benefit everybody. Unnecessary work shouldn't be there. You should make an efficient society that will minimize the amount of time people have to labor to earn a living. Make it more efficient, therefore a mother can take care of her child and doesn't have to be in a factory producing the bare necessities.